welcome to 21st Century Vitalism, a podcast asking the question, what does it mean to be fully alive in the 21st century, and how can we best embody that aliveness while dealing with the unique stressors that we face in this strange and potent time? I'm your host, Barrett Kane. I'm a licensed massage therapist and mindfulness meditation instructor, and joining us on the show today is my new friend, Morgan Mandala, to talk about live painting, collaboration, and psychedelic art. For those who are unfamiliar with Morgan's work, she's a live performance painter who travels not only the United States, but the entire world, going from music festivals and really channeling the essence of that space into her art. Um, she is an incredible being who I would consider in the, in the top 10 of the psychedelic art scene. Um, I've known of her since... Uh, probably 2012, I think. So this has been a really awesome opportunity for me to sit down and to kind of pick her brain on some of the internal processes that go down when you're making art as intricate and as unique as hers is. So within this conversation, we talk a lot about the music festival scene and how the visual art element actually creates uh, an opportunity for a level of deepening that hasn't really been seen before the transformational festival uh, brand, if you will, started to sweep throughout uh, the United States. So we also talk a lot about the process of painting, what the headspace is that you want to be in to actually have this level of mastery. We talk about the idea of collaboration. Uh, we do dive into her time at Electric Forest and spending 16 hours a day with all of her really good friends and what that's like to be collaboratively ushering in a new vision while you're dealing with this very um, chaotic environment that has a lot of unique energies to it. We also talk a little bit about what it's like for her to be in a romantic partnership with another artist who is uh, an incredible artist in his own right. You've probably heard of Randall Roberts if you're in the scene and just like what that kind of situation is like when you're both uh, at the peak of your creative output and also managing a relationship. So this is a pretty cool conversation. This was a lot of fun for me. Uh, as many of you know, I do kind of come from the music festival scene and I have a lot of influence from that uh, that arena. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, how this relates to vitality. Uh, for me, the idea of art creation is a huge theme that I want to keep circling back on in this show because I think it really is the peak level of expression that requires a lot of harmonious moving parts in someone's life to consistently show up and to produce beautiful works that inspire and transmit genuine, potentially transformational messages to its viewers. So this really, for me, is the spearhead of a lot of the stuff that we talk about on this show. And I really do think Morgan is uh, nestled in a really uh, prime real estate, so to speak, to um, really speak on this. I think that she's really embodying the the practice and path of transformational art in a way that um, we can all learn something from. Even if you're not an artist, there's definitely some big takeaways from this that I think are really juicy. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you want to check out Morgan's work while you're listening to this, I definitely suggest she's on Instagram, Facebook, or the website morganmandala.com. Uh, even if you have to pause if you're on your phone and just go absorb some of that stuff before you actually listen to this episode, just so you can get a really solid feel for who this being is and what she's bringing into the world. I think it'll greatly enhance your enjoyment of this episode, though it is a great talk regardless. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. I wanted to have an announcement for y'all. Uh, 21st Century Vitalism is going live. So this upcoming weekend, uh, I think it's the last weekend of August here, I'm going to be doing a two-day workshop series on mindfulness meditation at the Big Fam Music Festival in northern Michigan. They got Sun Squabby headlining, uh, a ton of local talent, a ton of talent from across the United States. It's going to be a... Uh, really awesome family reunion for a lot of the folks that are involved. So I'm really excited to bring the apex of my offering into a live space where I can actually guide people into the present moment in a way that is uh, non-judgmental and kind. 
Uh, so yeah, that's my big announcement. Um, if you want to support the show, um, I do have a Patreon. So that is going to be patreon.com slash 21st Century Vitalism. Those rewards aren't active yet. I'm waiting until I reach a certain amount of average listeners before I start releasing uh, more bonus content. I do have a lot of stuff that I'm just like waiting to uh, kind of open the floodgates on. So the sooner that we can get um, on that, then uh, the more content you y'all can get. Uh, if you don't want to support financially, I totally understand. It's a crazy time out there. Head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review. Genuinely, it is podcast gold. So I, I would really greatly appreciate it. Every one I feel deeply and immensely because I know it's it's going out of your way, but it shows that the, the show is landing and you want to support and see this thing really launch this rocket off. Um, you can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube. Any interaction that you do with any of the the channels or platforms is huge and it is felt, especially at this stage where I'm starting to get some momentum and starting to get some higher ticket guests, if you will. Not that any of my guests have been anything but spectacular in my humble opinion. Um, yeah, any interaction truly helps and I appreciate you to the moon. So that's all we have going on today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed making it. This was a lot of fun for me to be able to sit down and talk with somebody that I have always had a fondness of. So sit back, uh, do some stretches, drink some tea, open your heart for Morgan Mandala. Morgan Mandala, hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I've been a fan of your art for no joke. It's going on a decade now. So I found you in 2012 by attending the Rootwire Festival in Ohio, which is kind of where I get a lot of my guests. I'm just like, oh yeah, those were cool people that inspired me. That so, was a really, really special year and event and yeah. life-changing for a lot of people. Yeah, it definitely was for me coming off from, I, I was going to a lot of music festivals and kind of falling into like the party scene and uh, just had a few uh, experiences at both 2012 and 13 at Rootwire that completely offset my course and changed everything. So I agree. Yeah, yeah. same here. Definitely. Yeah. Randall and I met um, at Rewire, actually. Whoa, that's so cool. Yeah, so that yeah. changed our lives dramatically. Um, but yeah, huge, huge family ties, I feel like, of friends and, and artists. And a really, really strong community was built on Rewire 2012 and 13. That still lasts and has grown in beautiful ways. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to be where we're at now. I remember kind of having a naive outlook like, yeah, this is going to be going and we're just going to keep building this. But part of me kind of feels like it needed to end so that people could take that inspiration and then spread it out into the rest of their lives. Whereas we we had this container, we just keep bringing it to the container, but really forced us to like, if we really want to see this change, to really embody it and to really take it into heart and, you know, live it. Yeah, we would have maybe taken it for granted if it just happened year after year after year. And you know, I think COVID has kind of made us really um, take a step back and realize how lucky all of these gatherings that we've had, that time that we shared together is so special and continues yeah. to be and like how we need to take that back and plant seeds where we are. And I think through this whole time of not being able to gather in those festival communities, people are really integrating in their own communities which is really kind of cool to see happen yeah yeah i'm really curious uh especially this next year as things begin to open up i've kind of thought like it's going to go down like one of two roads like when people reintegrate back into the festival space there's either going to be and it's probably going to be both but people are going to have a newfound appreciation for the community and like really want to bring their gifts to the situation but then i could also see the the response of like, oh, we can finally party and then just like put the pedal to the metal on that because that's what festivals offer us is both of those things. So I just think it's going to be energetically a really interesting 
um, return to form. And hopefully we can have some lasting change and deepen as a community and how we show up. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. I think there's going to be um, all of the above happening, you know, a lot of love and a lot of partying. And, um, but you know, the one, the one thing we did do this year, we did um, pop Dosio at Red Rocks live painted for that first event after COVID. And it was really, really beautiful. And, full of love and it didn't seem like people were going overboard. It just seemed like people were so grateful to be back together. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but it all goes along. You know, I think this whole festival transformational scene, there's all the good and the bad comes along with it. And hopefully there's a net that can at least support those people who are going off the deep end in some way. Yeah. I think that's honestly what's really powerful about the work that you do and other fellow artists, not just the musicians, but the visual artists, is that that kind of serves as the net. Because, I mean, when people are really loaded and off the deep end and kind of spiraling out into different spaces, oftentimes they end up at the art tent. <laughs> um, and then that's when they have this opportunity to actually come into contact with an image, which is kind of like a condensed idea of an aspect of reality that then, because they're, they're so raw, it implants themselves. So I really think that the work you do is that net. We, we try to be, uh, I mean, for me as a, uh, going to my first couple of big events like that, my first time I saw anyone live painting ever was at sea of dreams in 2006, Martina Hoffman, Hoffman and Robert Venosa. Um, and they had a gallery set up with, you know, Venosas that were like larger than life size. And it was one of the most moving, you know, I ended up taking a little too much LSD and it was found myself in that gallery nearly in tears. Just couldn't believe that art like, like that existed because I'd been searching for something like it. And for so long and felt like uh, my art wasn't really understood or um, there might not be a place for it in the world, but that was kind of my saving grace and in a way um, inspiration and held me and kind of sent me off on that, a journey in that space. But also we kind of know that just from the experience, like electric forest, for instance, you know, that kids will take too much there sometimes and luckily there's a lot of love and they usually have friends but they will find themselves and what we think of as like the womb of the art gallery and our art space and we try to set up flowers and benches and things that make you comfortable and let them have their own experience and journey with the paintings that can hopefully bring them back to center so we do try to kind of purposefully have um, messages or little maps back to you in our paintings for people to kind of get lost in um, all the intricacies just back to the one if so if they are having those experiences we do hope that the gallery space um, can be a comforting more calm place for people to kind of take an inward journey yeah Something I've always appreciated about the the gallery spaces at these festivals, and I love that you called it a womb. That is such a beautiful analogy for like the warmth that you feel. Like if it's like two a.m. and you walk into the space, everything gets down like downshifted, and it's just it just to be in these spaces. It like is calming to the nervous system, and I think that in itself really does help kind of ground people. And the fact that you are intentionally creating a space that points people back to them, I think something that I subconsciously experienced when I've entered spaces like this was we're, we can always do that. You know, that that's what we do with the rest of our life is that we create a space around us and a container for whoever comes into our, our sphere can get a reminder that like, Oh, the truth of who they are. And that's not even folks who are like on a substance. It's just like the people who are lost in the commute of the forward trajectory of their lives and the, the distractedness and you know it really is like a training in how to do that with yourself that's it's an amazing idea yeah and and i think having something different in the festivals because it didn't used to be like there was an art gallery at a music festival it's kind of a fairly new thing in the past 10 15 years um but yeah for anyone who maybe isn't 
gets lost from their friends and wanders in there or isn't feeling the music that day or, or, you know, sometimes festivals are hard and, and just to have a break somewhere separate. Um, yeah. And so we do try to point it back and have it be a home space, have it be a warm space, a place of connection, um, community, just a different welcoming vibe. And yeah. I love the way that we're talking about music festivals right now. Like it's kind of just like <laughs> Mad Max kind of like, there's just, I mean, I also want to acknowledge that like, even the party is also an important element of this. I don't think that we should be like chastising the folks who are in the mindset of like, got to do more, got to take more, got to be more. You know, I think that that also creates the heightened charge that allows people to have these experiences. You got to be able to experience the high before you can like go in, you know, sometimes that's what you need to like shake up your, your framework, you know? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, at, they're transformational festivals. You can choose to transform how you please, whether it's through yoga, meditation, you know, chanting or psychedelics and going deep with your friends and having this experience and no judgment on any of it. Really. It's, it's mm -hmm. a place for people to explore and, and I hope they do and, and that they're safe and, and, have the love and um but yeah it is it it can be both it can be this like beautiful sweet wonderful um well thought out experience of the festival or sometimes you know things can get crazy but it makes you all the stronger i think whether it's you know crazy weather crazy um just just unexpected things and tent you know to campsite things that go bad or floods and I don't know. There's a lot that can happen, which makes it, I think, even more special and powerful of an experience. Yeah. I like the idea of expecting the unexpected. Yeah. Some of those things that like, when I look back at my festival experiences, the ones that I remember the strongest, I don't know if you remember, or if you've heard of Hoopla on the Hills, uh, it was this Ohio festival. Nice. What? What's that? I've heard stories. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Those are the festivals that you hear the stories about. Cause it's like, it was soup line, like snowed and there was just like giant <laughs> ice puddles everywhere. And, but it was one of those experiences that like really kind of shifted me in like a pretty profound way, you know? So even that, like, there's no like bad experience. There's just challenging experiences. Exactly. So I'm kind of curious, you mentioned the, the first time that you saw a live painter and it sounded like, that is what gave you like the okay to kind of express the kind of art that you're currently making. Um, before you even saw other visionary art or psychedelic art, were you kind of already leaning in that camp or were these experiences what shaped your current art as it is? Um, I was always an artist. I always loved to draw and, and paint and make anything photography. Um, and I was, I was already somewhat interested in psychedelics in general, just because I had, you know, I had a experience when I was a teenager, I kind of went, I went through a long rough patch of like being really depressed, having a lot of issues, with loss and sadness. And I got into some hard drugs. I did heroin for a couple of years and luckily, you know, quit all of that, never went back. But I did notice that my experience with psychedelics, I knew something was different and something was important. And there was, um, and I did study a lot of shamanism. And so I, I got interested in what those experiences were showing me visually. Um, so I was always kind of like wanting to explore that realm with my art, but not really knowing how, and also knowing that like, it's so taboo. And so at the time, um, not many people had been coming out about these experiences that they've had or shared. And so I felt like there wasn't as much of a space for it, the kind of fantastic, you know, abstract realism art that I wanted to make. Um, I was in school at the time and, uh, my teachers, I, I wanted to make what I called geometriscapes, which are just like, you know, geometry. Geometry integrated with the land, which is still what I, you know, I'm aiming for as I, as I continue. But, um, they're like, no, you have to choose realism or abstract. Like don't combine them. It's not, it's not going to work. It doesn't look good. And, um, basically made me, made me choose. So to get an A 
or to pass the classes I had to choose. So I started making abstract art for the first time. Um, but seeing Martina and Robert's art opened my eyes up. And I knew Alex Gray, you know, so I knew a few artists then. And, and I so I started to see that there was this underground community of artists who were painting the like this fantastic divine um realm somewhere between reality and spirituality um in pigment though and 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 doing a great job and translating it in such beautiful ways i didn't think there was space for it so when i saw them it did inspire me to kind of keep going in the path that i wanted to not just kind of bent to do what an artist was expected to do because there was um space for that expression and people even if there weren't that many people, there were still people listening. Um, and yeah, I just, I never had art made, make me feel like that before. So intensely, you know, just, um, it was different. It was di I'd been to museums and seen classics and they're amazing, you know, some of them, but these were hit you on a spiritual level, hit you on a level that wasn't just, you weren't just gawking in, in awe at someone's masterful painting skills and how well they could recreate something. It was, um, it was like they gave you a bit of the spirit and the love that they experienced in that painting. Wow, I love that. So I, I used the term uh, a little bit already, but I actually want to dial it back. I, I keep considering your art visionary art because that's the term that I'm most familiar with. And that is uh, the term that Alex Gray, I think he might have even coined it or at least made it popular. But I, I kind of want to ask you, what would you consider your art? Like, how do you view your output into the world? Yeah, I don't know, I guess. I, I would say... Visionary is what we say because I think that's just like a, a blanket term for kind of any psychedelic spiritual art. Some of my art, I would say, is visionary. I would say I have like a visionary series. Um, and then I would say some is like kind of surreal or fantastic realism, maybe. Um, and the, the term visionary is is good in a sense, but I also think um, all art can be considered visionary in a way. Um, but I think it, for the kind of, it kind of says that implies that you're maybe taking psychedelics or inducing visions or using dreams. So, um, I would say some of my art may be like that, but a lot of it is inspired from, you know, just the pure feeling of an experience and not necessarily a vision I might've had. Do you have some art pieces that are actually inspired by visions as well, though, or? I do have a couple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, I went back in 2011, 2012. I did ayahuasca with a shaman we met in Peru. Um, and so I do have a couple paintings from those experiences. Okay. And those are kind of more like putting together snippets of visions that I have. And I still have a couple from those experiences that I might paint um just having it yeah but occasionally i do or dreams are pretty inspiring but i usually find that it's hard for a vision to fit nicely on a canvas or yeah. or make sense even right um, so you kind of have to reinterpret some things at least me it's not like i get these burned images in my mind of exactly what i'm going to create which some people do so i mean luke brown i feel like he he does that he gets yeah straight up visions and downloads that he paints but um, i'm not one of those people in my standard procedure mm -hmm. so what do you think like the process is for people who may have not been in a psychedelic space or had these kind of visionary expansive states like when they consume art like this i i mean i i'm a big art fan and i've shown a lot of art to folks and i usually get like a mix of reactions some people are kind of like that's trippy art and like they use the term trippy as a means to kind of diminish their ability to receive it. They kind of like, oh yeah, drugs. But it's like a filter that keeps them from actually touching what the art is communicating. Do you think that you need to have been in an expansive state in order to like really feel the full effect of this stuff? Or do you think it has uh, the ability to like poke a hole in those filters? Like what, what's your interpretation of that? 
I think it does. I think you're exactly right in that sometimes it can be marginalized just by like people see a few certain things like, oh, well, that's trippy. I don't, that's not, I don't get it. I don't want to see it. Um, and sometimes images can be more confronting. I think especially visionary art is, is confronting sometimes. It's not just a casual abstract expressionist color palette on the wall. Um, it demands to be viewed and to be understood. And so we've actually, we had an experience. Um, we had art, we had an art show at the Ken Wilber um, Center here in Boulder. It has since closed, but we had an art show there. Alex Nelson Gray did a talk. And then Randall and I had some paintings hanging in their kind of main chapel area for a few months. My painting, Trinity, which is kind of the Pieta remix, and Randall's um, painting of Alan Watts. And you'd think the Integral Center was the name of it. And um, Ken Wilber is, you know, been into psychedelics openly. He's a friend of Alex Gray. He's, he's got a, had a bunch of kind of classes and things going on at the center that weren't related to that, though. So a bunch of people were just regular Boulderites, they're going for yoga, they're going for meditation classes, they're going for many things. A lot of them hadn't had psychedelic experiences, some of them had. And what we found or what they found was like people were so confronted by these images. Some people loved them, some people just couldn't handle it, and it kind of freaked them out. And then we ended up having to go take them down. Um, but when we did, we talked to two of the people working there. And they were really beautifully honest with us because um, one of them had like had spent some time with both of the pieces. And he's like, you know, I got to be honest at first, Alan Watts, I really hated that painting. It really bothered me. I like didn't want to look at it. And every day as I've been coming in here and looking at these paintings, they become my favorite paintings. And now that I've looked at it and seen the detail and now I figured out who Alan Watts is and I've started reading his stuff and I see all the symbolism and and he was just so confronted at first by these saintly intense looking images that he didn't really want to decipher them um, and look inside and see what that means and reflects in yourself like when people are confronted they like to push it away instead of say whoa okay this makes me feel something why does it make me feel that where's that feeling coming from? Like, what is it in this that evokes that in me? And so I think, you know, we did have to take them down because they're too much for people, but in a way it's kind of an amazing compliment because it wasn't art that people didn't notice. You know, they had, they had to notice it. They had to be confronted with it and they couldn't handle it. That's their thing. I get that. Um, but I'm, but it was so moving to see the kind of the transformation in one person through looking at art that they thought they didn't like. Mm. And so that was a really cool kind of insight to someone who's not in the psychedelic world, having these really profound experiences with our paintings. Wow. It's interesting that the Alan Watts one is the one that got him too. Cause that one, like I, I know the painting and it's beautiful. It's and beautiful. I mean, I guess even if you don't know who Alan Watts is, I just, that's interesting that there was like a strong, charged response and as you were saying that i had this idea that like these paintings when you put something that it that powerful up it's shining a light and oftentimes it's shining a light and you see the blockages in yourself that are actually casting shadow from the light so rather than see the part of you that's actually lighting up they focus on the shadow and then it's like ooh, that scares me you know but it's really an opportunity to open to that part of yourself and that gentleman, he looked into Alan Watts and what a gift, you know, once you find those lectures, it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It is an invitation to look in the shadow side, the dark side. And I, I understand why people would avoid it, but if you can break through, I think it's, it's worth it. Yeah. It's really kind of, at some point you're going to have to, you know. Yeah. Whether it's this lifetime or the next, you know, yeah. it's something you got to process. And it kind of also reminds me of, um, I mean, doubling back to like music festivals, you know, the, the uncomfortability that we sometimes face. I mean, even if things are like going great, you know, waiting in a long line at a porta potty, mm -hmm. you know, like all these things bring us to the moment in a very specific way. And I know some people who just don't like music festivals, like they're just like, uh, 
people kind of smell they're rubbing up on me and there's just like a lot of aversion even though they've literally never been to one and it's just like it's the part of themselves that are actually getting blocked you know so the path of taking in visionary art the path of participating in transformational festivals is one of being on the edge of your comfort you know and i think that it if you're not ready to do that then it can be really triggering yeah definitely i mean <clears throat> a lot of we talk about live painting a lot is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and just kind of re doing that all the time because there are these vulnerable places you put yourself into and just knowing that it's going to getting used to it's going to be okay you're going to figure that out you're going to work through the ugly part of the painting in front of everyone and it's going to be great you know but it's it might not be comfortable for every moment and fest music festivals i would say it's it's rare to go through a weekend of doing a mural at electric forest without someone in the group crying there's going to be tears you know and tears of joy too but it's um it is transformative and you're in a vulnerable difficult space but i think that is what makes it so wonderful as well because you have to kind of give up so many things that make you comfortable in the day to just be here with these people and enjoy this time and this experience which is so different from you know snuggling at home in your comfy bed with your nice toilet next to you and yeah yeah that's an interesting idea and i've never actually i don't know why i've never like considered being in on the collaboration at one of these live events because i've always been a consumer or a viewer you know but i can imagine it's almost probably like a ritual you know like you are in it for the 12 hours for the weekend whatever you're dedicating your time to and i'm yeah. sure there are moments when you look over you're working with some of the best people in the industry or the some of the most accredited and you're like wow they're really crushing it am i crushing it like i'm sure you have to work through all of these like latent inadequacies and just all the uncomfortable parts and it really it it can be really purgative, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, we try to like now, um, at least foresee kind of the, the mental process of the days of painting as like for something like electric forest, for instance, we're usually, um, it's, it's a long week. We show up a few days before and set up our installation. And once the festival starts, which is usually four days in a row, um, we're painting for like 16 plus hours a day with lights on us in a, in a booth. So we're like going, and I think you probably do go through all the whole roller coaster of emotions. Um, but luckily since we're such good friends with the people we paint with, that makes it a lot easier to kind of have our like shoulders to lean on. We have a, our, a girl always helping us with merch, usually crystal sister, Rachel, so that we can kind of just keep to painting for our support system with each other. Um, you know, there are, there are definitely tough moments just because you're in front of so many people for so long. And there are definitely times where you feel like everyone's crushing it and you're like, Oh, what am I doing? I'm just not hitting it right. And then what I always think is like, you paint best when you don't think. So we're just trying to get out of our own way and just keep going. And, and that's almost easier when it's a live painting because, you know, you have people watching you, you know, the lights are on, everyone else is working. It just kind of keeps the flow going. And if you keep going, if you get stuck, you move on and someone else goes over the part you were stuck on. You're like, thank God, like that, that makes it go a lot faster too. Um, but yeah, usually like the first day is really the first maybe day and a half we're like oh man this looks really bad are we going to be able to recover this like but always by usually like the third day we really find the stride and like figure out where the painting's going the fourth day it looks pretty good it's amazing it's amazing that you might be having that experience because i've never once while walking through a festival been like "Ooh, that art Ooh, they gotta cut that out it's always been like <laughs> dang and i'm sure that everybody is also feeling that same way yeah i think it's impossible not to just but trying to like recognize when you do feel and be like, okay, that's not helpful. I'm here doing this. So let's just do it and have fun. Do you think that that carries over to the rest of your life too? That ability to kind of set aside like, oh, I'm having this strong emotion, but I have not like suppressing it, but like feeling the texture of it. And then, okay, that's not helpful. I I'm kind of that way anyways, personally, I, 
I don't know why I'm, I'm very like more logical with my emotions. Um, so if I am feeling something strong emotionally, I will definitely figure out where that's coming from before taking it to the next level of expression, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, like I, it's not that I won't express things. I'll just like figure out like, okay, what's the right way to express this? Um, where is it coming from? And, you know, as to not involve other people or in the way that they shouldn't be. But do, it's just do, a personal thing. Do you think that was cultivated through your art practice? Because that's not something that a lot, like, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I have an emotion, I'm going to yell. <laughs> yeah, you... yeah. Um, I think it was a combination of things. Like, art definitely helps. I think, like, um, practicing nonviolent communication helps. I had, like, when I was young, my parents would yell a lot, and it was so intense for me. And I'd like realize that that wasn't the way to go about things and what's a more efficient, effective way to communicate with empathy where you can get your point across, but not hurt people's feelings. Um, and even if people are hurtful, you know, it's like you can, you can find a space there to express that without making it worse. Um, but I think art has helped as well because it does allow you a lot more introspection and allows you to kind of like, place something that you created outside of yourself so it's almost in a way like your emotions like if you look at them as you and just react like you you you're feeling your emotions but you aren't them so they're, they're telling you information like i'm painting this thing it's not me so if someone hates it like i can't take it too personally but i can improve it um so i think they do definitely have some kind of correlations with self-assessment and and recognizing that you are not your art, you are not your emotions, even though they're strongly connected to you. That's powerful. Yeah, I've been learning a lot through my meditation practice, like the energy of emotions, because I definitely have not had the most like logical grasp. But in my developing mindfulness, I'm able to see when something manifests in my body, and I'm able to like, oh, that's like, that's in my chest, like anger is a tightening, it's a physiological thing. And even just that level of awareness, it helps keep it from, if you don't have that level of awareness, then it's like the thoughts in your head multiply by the feelings in your body. So 10 times 10 is 100. But then if you're able to see it where it's like, I have thoughts in my head, a tightening in my chest, I'm sweaty, that's 10 plus 10 plus 10. So that's like 30 rather than 100. That makes yeah. sense. It's like, yeah, it's just like you're experiencing anger right now. It is a passing motion, like... How can you make yourself feel better? Like deep breaths are great. You know, even any time of day you can do that. So I think um, through art too is kind of a meditative practice. I think it, you do develop some sort of mindfulness and kind of watching your thoughts and your emotions run through your head and trying to get back to that not thinking at all. So it is in a way, it's like a form of meditation, I yeah. think, for me. Yeah. Do you, so when you're in the art space, when you're making one of your amazing pieces that you're doing, like the nature of your thoughts, like they just kind of come and go. Are you in a space where you're just like not even thinking or like, what is, what's it like inside the, the human who's doing the art at the peak of your creation? If I, my goal with each like long painting session is to get to a place where you're not thinking, where you're just painting and not, and you're just doing that what's in front of you. So it's like, your attention is the tip of the brush. Um, and if you can kind of go automatic without even thinking as far as like opening yourself up to creating new things in the intricacies of like maybe some brush strokes in the back, that's where new things can happen. That's where you can like make some discovery. So I think the ultimate goal, and sometimes it can take like three hours to get to that point or two hours or whatever, um, is to like paint without thinking and being kind of like almost like a trance state, but not, you know what I mean? It's just, um, full flow meditative state. And then otherwise, you know, you'll definitely have, like, if you've ever tried to meditate, passing thoughts, negative thoughts, things that you kind of have to see and watch and either let escape and kind of redirect yourself over and over. Um, it's easy to get distracted. So I try to sometimes even place myself in spaces like I paint on my porch sometimes because I don't get service out there. So that's a great way to not get distracted by anything. Just have everything I need 
and get a few hours in to not like look at my phone or check to see who texted or, or whatever. Um, so that I think is, it's, it's like the mind of meditation in a way, right? You're trying to empty, you're watching your thoughts and you're trying to empty again and watching your thoughts. Um, and then, you know, can get kind of analytical if you're doing something like where I have to think like a mathematical one dollar or something where I have to be accurate. But yeah. you do you notice that in the live painting settings when you're at a place like Electric Forest, does that process kind of change for you or it, 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 do you just show up the same no matter the location? We pretty much show up the same. Actually, collaborations are really, really fun. Because the last thing we think about is what we're going to paint. So we show up and we think about the installation, what little items we're going to bring, special things from home to put around it, what flowers we're going to put up, how to make sure we have all of our tools. And then it's really fun to not have to worry about what the painting is going to be. So we'll show up. And the great thing about collaborating with good friends is we all love and trust each other. And we do kind of like an intuitive flow painting. So we'll just all start usually with the same color so we can kind of keep it reeled in at first and just start making lines and flowing and intuitively painting. And that makes it so easy to get into the flow space because of the energy of the people around you. You have your friends, everyone just kind of attacking this painting and you know <laughs> that it doesn't look good right away. But that's kind of part of the fun of it is because with any painting, if you go over it enough, if you keep painting, you're going to love it and it's going to be better. So we can have a lot of fun and you, there's no need to think. We're just watching this thing happen in front of us. And um, so I feel like in those, that's why I think it's easy to paint for 16 hours at a time at Electric Forest because we're just full flow. It's exciting. You have the energy of the crowd behind you, the music. Everyone's so happy to be there. Um so that live painting is more like getting straight in, straight shot into the meditation point because you're forced by the energy around you to channel it into something. Mm -hmm. I love that. That sounds so good. Like I got goosebumps. Yeah. Do you feel like the space that you're in is kind of creating the art almost more like through you? Like I almost get the feeling that it's like you might be the hand that's making it, but it's like the attention and the consciousness of everybody who's witnessing it and the space itself. Like I imagine electric forest, that space has an expression that's coming through everybody, but also you. I a hundred percent. I think it makes a huge difference. Every painting we make at a festival wouldn't be the way it was unless it was there. If that makes sense. And sometimes we'll take elements and incorporate them into the painting from wherever we are. But I definitely think that the people, the vibe, the whole situation strongly influences and maybe just almost fully creates what we make. It's less, we kind of just like are there as conduits and let whatever happens happens and bounce off of each other for ideas too. And um, yeah, I think we're painting with other people, new things happen as well. What happens with the combination of all your brush strokes together and um, it's like jamming and music or like jazz, like mm -hmm. it's different, probably whatever night it is or whoever's there that night that's kind of reading the crowd and, and playing like that. This might be kind of an abstract question, but do you feel like when you return to a space, say like Electric Forest, you've done it for a few years, do you feel a sense of familiarity, even though the project is different? Do you kind of feel like the character, like the spirit of that space, like, is, is there a sense of familiarity and consistency between the years or is it just entirely different every time? I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think there's definitely a familiarity, um, for sure. Cause we are always in our little tree house that, uh, Maddie G the builder built for us for the installation, really on crystals idea, crystallize. Um, so it's kind of like our little home space. And we have our little gallery on top. We have our locker. It feels very familiar. And every year there's people coming back who are the same people who come and see us and check on the mural. And like, so it does feel like a reunion every year, kind of like a homecoming. And even though there are different people and, and different music, it, it definitely feels like um, 
kind of a reunion. Yeah. And not every festival is like that, but I would say most ones that we do like twice in a row or like rainbow serpent in Australia really felt like that too. Like it kind of feels like you're, you're going back home mm. or going back to the same vibe. Mm. And I can only imagine that the same thing applies to specific bands too. Like I immediately thought like Papadocio is an, it's a vibe. It's an energy that in my opinion goes well beyond just the guys on the stage. I had Anthony on the show and he was kind of saying the same thing. Like he also feels like a conduit for something that's in the space. Like, like the idea of Papadocio is that we're all co-creating it, even the live artists, the participants. So do you kind of feel like the personality of the energy of the music is also kind of coming through the brush as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Papadocio, especially they have such a sweet vibe and crowd and such nice boys. It feels very like loving and warm. Um, so I think that definitely influences the painting and, you know, when we're at, like, I love Tipper, but some Tipper shows, it's like, whoa, mm. like the painting feels, it feels a lot crunchier, yeah. um, which can be great. And it, it definitely brings out, uh, different aspects of creativity and different energies from the crowd. Um, and I think especially with a music festival, when you have kind of all of those little tribes coming together, it creates a really... Uh, unique mix and kind of soup of, of different pe personalities. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Papadocio has their own flavor. Every band does, really. So. Yeah. So now that we're, we've kind of talked a little bit about, um, like, the essence of, like, live shows and, like, that kind of free flow kind of expression where you're, like, channeling, I, I've seen a lot of your art that looks like it has a very specific intention. Like, it looks like there was something that you wanted to communicate. So with those kinds of paintings, would, would you say that you do have pieces like that or am I projecting? Yeah. 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 What, what's like the, the difference in approach to that when you're like, I have a very specific goal. Like you said, you use like mathematics for some things. Like well, how does that play out? Not too much math, but um, <laughs> so I will have basically like sketches. If I have like an idea, I'll have a basic kind of, skeleton sketch of what the painting is going to be kind of a generic outline or, or um map of where things are going to be at if i don't have some room to explore and kind of figure out what's going to go here or there then i get really bored and i feel like i'm painting myself into a corner so i try to always leave some room for intuitive painting to happen but um yeah so basically like for my painting trinity for example, I knew I wanted to do a Pieta remake that it was going to kind of be the divine mother goddess. And through working on it, I had a sketch of just um, the Pieta with the skeleton instead of Jesus and then wings on the Pieta for some reason. And as I was painting it, Randall was like, you know, you got to have a reason for these wings. Why are there wings there? And I was like, I know, I, I don't know why they're there. They have to be. I haven't figured it out yet. And I was doing the rest of the painting and I had this kind of yantra on the back um, that was just meant to be like a stained glass window behind Mary. And then I knew I didn't want it to be Mary and Jesus, though I wanted it to be more of an a archetype of the Divine Mother. And then as I was doing just more research and kind of going over notes um, from studying art history in college and, and different um, world religions and traditions, I found Morgan, who's the Celtic goddess of basically bringing people from life to death, death to life. She has wings and transforms into birds um, as she takes people through the different realms. So, and then Kali, I knew that at first the painting was just going to be a combination of Mary and Kali, and that's why um, her skin is blue. So then Kali is kind of the Hindu version of that same thing this like she is ultimately loving but she is someone who is between the realms of life and death and a loving mother who also will is the destroyer so once i found the third goddess in the trinity morrigan which is the reason for the wings then i was kind of like that was my missing link of i knew this painting had meaning and intention but there was some parts that i knew had to be there that i had to figure out so um, I had part of the story, and as I worked on the painting, the rest of the story kind of revealed itself. 
to me through that. And then I also saw that the yantra, the shape in the background that was um, going to be, it was like Kali's yantra, and it was also the stained glass window. And apparently Morrigan also shares similar symbols with the same eight-pointed um, petaled kind of flower as the goddesses as well. So it was just like really synchronistic and, and kind of meant to be. It was intention plus magic, I guess. Wow. That's so cool. Like the deep symbolism that was like already present in the piece and you didn't even know. It's almost like a, uh, what do they call it? Like a sculptor who's like sculpting a piece from stone. Like it's already there and you're just kind of uncovering it. And then it's like yeah. informing you as well. It's this like reciprocal process that is a really, true. and that's also, I was going to bring that piece up because it's probably my favorite piece of yours. I like a lot of your stuff, but that one, it like, that's one of those pieces that like hits you and you're just like, Ooh, I don't know. I'm having an experience like, Ooh, that's good. <laughs> you know, I, so hey, you meant... special to me. And, um, oh, sorry. No, continue, please. I'd love to hear more about it. <laughs> oh, no, I was, um, yeah, I was just going to say that, but I do feel like that all paintings are, even if you go into them with an intention, you can learn. So it's a conversation and there is a sense that, while you're creating something, you are pulling something out. You're, you're letting it be what it wants to be. So you have to like, listen as well as, um, put your own intention in it as well. So I like to do a little bit of both. I don't know if you're familiar with like the guru principle. Um, but essentially like the guru isn't just like a person, but it's actually an energy that is all pervasive. So if you're familiar with like Ram Dass, his guru is Maharaji, but it wasn't actually the little old man in the blanket. It was actually Ram Dass's own spirit. And the same thing applies to all of us. And we're always having messages and being communicated to. And it almost seems like, like painting is almost like a spiritual path where you actually make contact with that guru principle. And it's actually showing you yourself, you know? Yeah, so, I love that. Yeah. I, love that. I think just, you're completely right. Any path you, I think that you go down all the way can kind of lead you there. It's yeah. like, it's its own little fractal into, um, yeah, your own, you're back to yourself, back to the one. And it's interesting because you make your art for other people. I mean, there's an element of serving yourself, but a big part of it is like, I want to make this art so I can communicate to other people. And I think it's through the service and the intention of sharing your gifts with other people that you actually start to make contact and then you start to get those gifts yourself. So it, you always have to like offer it out, but in the same point, like you're also going to be getting the, the milk of wisdom, you know? So it's, it's collaboration, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Collaboration with whatever it is that I'll take help from anywhere I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so you brought up, uh, th that Randall had, a suggestion for you uh you know you were doing these wings and he kind of encouraged you like well why do you why are you doing these wings something i'm really interested in and this is something that i noticed with like alex and alice and gray this idea of a partnership of two artists who are both very into their art i'm just kind of curious what that's been like for you as somebody who you're very that you're both very accomplished and well renowned in the scene what what yeah, how is that to be dating somebody who's also on the same path and you can collaborate? And I mean, you don't have to get like too specific about, you know, what you guys ate for breakfast, but <laughs> you know. No, it's it's great. It's um, it's really easy. It, we always just had a really easy time working together. Actually, we we met Root Wire 2012. We had done a couple festivals with each other, but it was Root Wire 2013 that Aaron Cruz asked me and. Crystal and Randall and Crystal is one of my best friends has been, she was then and now. And, um, we're like basically crystallize. Yeah. Crystallize. Okay, just, okay. Um, so they asked us to make a painting together at this little altarpiece for Rootwire 2013. And that was the first time Randall and I actually painted together, which was so fun and easy right away. And we just kind of kept talking and kept talking and made another painting together. Just us a few months later. And I think after that, we were kind of like, this is pretty awesome. You know, like, what else could you really ask for? So, um, yeah, we we kind of dated long distance for a while. And um, we were lucky in that collaborating together is easy. It's 
flows effortlessly and that's kind of why you know what brought us together um and it is it is nice to have someone especially when we do things like traveling across the world to set up an installation at a festival to have someone who does the same job as you who knows exactly how to do it to where if i or he was sick or something and couldn't for some reason we always have the other person to kind of like help us back us up they know how to do all of our tasks if you have a partner who's not at all involved with the art world like trying to get them to stretch a circular canvas or do anything like that is like eh, it's not happening really <laughs> or you know even just like it's kind of hard for people to understand that musicians artists they, they like need to paint or make music or whatever and be in a studio for eight hours a day and i think um that's hard for some people to not feel secondary to art or, or someone else's career as their partner so i think it's lucky that we don't have that um and we're lucky we get along because we are with each other 24 hours a day seven days a week for everything so that's the one thing too that's like um requires some just like figuring out how to if you don't get along just in general that's it's it would be really hard i think to spend so much time with someone but we've gotten really lucky and try to remain grateful and so we, we collaborate with other things too and um yeah we, we just happen to align in all of these interests and, and it's really kind of a saving grace as a female solo live painter to now have randall <laughs> um it's just nice to like have a partner there to not be always dragging your stuff alone at three in the morning out of a club walking in a little city or something like it it's it's great um and we also still do our separate work so that's one thing we've been able to maintain kind of our autonomy and um appreciate our own work as well as our collaborations it's um but yeah if you can't it's it's different living with someone and doing everything again with them 24 hours a day and that has been probably it's the weirdest thing about our relationship i would think yeah i almost feel like being in the art space, if you're working on your own project, there is kind of like an energetic reprieve from each other because you're just, you're in relationship with your art more than you are like interacting. And do you kind of feel like collaborating with him as someone who's your partner has a different feel to it? Does it kind of create much different results than if you were to collaborate with anybody else? Is there like an extra charge to it or? Yeah, I think it's, it's weight just more open and easy um there's no like pensiveness there's no wondering if this is going to be okay for that person or what should be you know how you you're going to dance around each other um i think the more you paint with people the more comfortable it becomes and but always the first couple times are like a little like everyone's a little timid or like doesn't want to you know overstep boundaries or make people feel bad and it depends on the artist some artists are not timid and they'll completely take over and then that's a whole nother situation that that we don't necessarily love dealing with or when someone's trying to direct something too much it's just a different style so i feel like it's kind of a relief painting with randall because i know it will be easy and fun like that i don't have to think too much and um i won't be uncomfortable mm. really at any point it's really good so when you're looking out at the world of art and specifically the visionary art and kind of the more psychedelic abstract kind of stuff where do you want to find yourself in say like 10 to 15 years like what is your like ultimate kind of is there ever a point where not you're going to hang up your hat and quit but is there a point where you're like this is the full manifestation of my mastery you know do you have kind of something you're building towards yeah um a lot of things actually i mean i want to i feel like my art's probably a lifelong journey and i just hope to keep getting better and better and paying attention to where it leads me um and while you know i love i i look at a lot of other artists out there and like oh i wish i could be that good or in this gallery or whatever but i i really think that i want to trust my my own path and where that takes me and where my art what my art wants to be um, but we are here in Colorado, Randall and I have a place that we are 
kind of working on, we got a fixer upper in the mountains. So um, it had a really big outbuilding that we planned on remodeling for kind of a roadside art gallery studio. Um, and we did find out that that building was done so not up to code that we unfortunately have to, we have to tear it down and rebuild. So right now we are saving up to rebuild that and hope to have a little gallery studio where people can come and take workshops and, um, you know, build a little community art hub here in Boulder for people to come visit and stay and there's camping and beautiful nature around. Um, so hopefully, hopefully in five or 10 years, we'll have that kind of up and running to have a little hub here in Colorado. Um, and then, yeah, really, I, all I really want is to be able to be supported so I can sustain myself comfortably and make art. That's really all I ever want. I, yeah, it'd be nice to have a million dollars or something or sell a painting for a hundred grand, but maybe I'll get there someday. That'd be, a, that'd be a great goal. Um, but as long as I feel like I can sustain myself and be fairly comfortable and eat and have a roof over my head that doesn't leak anymore, which we're working on, <laughs> um, then, you know, I, I'll feel, I feel fulfilled and very lucky, really lucky. But um, it is definitely a goal to make paintings that I impress myself with, which might never happen, you know, <laughs> where you always, like, you know, you can do better than where you're at. So I want to just keep getting better. I know I have a lot of room for improvement, and um, I hope that it shows over the years. And I hope that we can have this little hub to have people come visit and um, share their art and have our friends share their art, too, and just bring everyone together. Do you kind of feel a draw towards the teacher role? Like you mentioned hosting workshops, that's something that you, you want to share and open up your world to other people. Yeah. I like doing, um, I like doing workshops every once in a while because not to say I'm even like, Oh, I should teach. Like I'm a teacher. I'm better than people. It's more just like, I love talking about art and creativity and helping people explore where they want their art to go and trying to help them take the steps to get there. And, um, even if it's just technical things, like I, I like helping people find their voice in art. And I think that is just such a beautiful thing to see and be a part of. And I like the community and camaraderie that comes with sharing the space of painting socially, but also, you know, you talk for a while, but then sharing those hours of silence working together is also really stimulating in this different way where you, you know, you might get distracted for a second. You see everyone around you silently working. Like, oh yeah. It, it's a different, great energy for painters. that I think, um, who tend to get, you know, hidden away alone in their house or in their studio for long periods of time. I think it's so good for us to get out together every once in a while and, and share that creative space. Yeah. Sure, it has its own kind of rejuvenative effect to be around other people who are as committed to their thing as you are. And yeah. I had the idea that, you know, I made this distinction, like, you're not already a teacher, but, and uh, I'm not trying to blow smoke up anybody's butt, but just being in a public space, such as a live music event, and dedicating 16 hours, like the grace and commitment that it takes to that, whether or not people realize it is a teaching in and of itself. It's kind of like watching like a martial art master, like do Tai Chi, you know, just like the, the fluidity of movement, the level of dedication. So, I mean, really everything that you're doing just by being an artist and living the artist path is a teaching, you know, so it, whether we it's hope, an extension. We hope that a little bit too, and, and electric forest, especially like we've had some really sweet reflections of people talking about how, you know, they love just the metaphor of us us doing something, creating something beautiful together. Um, just such good friends out of this love. We're kind of charging our love into this battery and, you know, it's, it's a grander metaphor that we can make something beautiful if we work together and maybe even just stay, take a step back from what you might intend or you want for something and see how it would be better if you take into consideration what the group might say. So, you know, if you're building your own house, it'd be one way. If you're building a house with five other people, it might not be, you might not get all the things you wanted, but it'll probably be a better house. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it'll be more unique. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's like, what can we, what can we all do together that makes it a bigger whole? Right. I think that that's something that applies to any sort of human endeavor in terms of understanding that you, you might have the complete vision of the thing, but it's actually maybe not like the most effective or sustainable vision and that we should really honor the fact that we are parts of a much larger thing. And I think a lot of people, especially here in America with our rugged individualism, want to be the ones who, wow, they saved the world. That one person, they, they really changed the thing. But by setting that aside and allowing yourselves to participate in a group collaboration is actually really liberating. You know, you don't have to take the whole world on your shoulders. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be all about you. It can just be about, you know, enjoying that the experience of creating it together is I think just as fun for people to watch as, you know, I think it's more fun for people to watch all of us than it would be for just one person. And because we're such good friends, I think, and we're kind of messing around and there's, you know, that lovey feeling, it's, it's special and it's more intimate than if it was just one painter kind of doing their flex and, you know, painting the whole thing, which is still amazing in its own right. Plus again, that's another teaching on just group dynamics, you know, people who may not have any sort of mastery they come across you all working in the forest where it's this really stimulating environment and they see this kind of kind of like watching like a flock of birds and how they like migrate and move together that in itself is a teaching of like our interdependence and how we can actually lean into each other and we're not just isolated beings so that is really powerful <laughs> that's yeah. the really transformative stuff in my opinion music yeah. is the same thing why we think collaboration is important, especially in that kind of environment. It, it just kind of ripples out in a really nice way on, on multiple levels. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick. I'm just kind of curious. What's your, what's your take on forest these days? Um, I feel like I've personally, and I'm not asking you to say anything if it's um, not what you want to talk about, but I, I, I've went since 2011 and I missed a couple of years, but I, I don't know if it's just because it was the age that I was in, but I've like had a kind of on and off relationship with it where I was like really swept away. Like this is beautiful. And then I've had some years where I'm like, I don't resonate with anybody. <laughs> I don't know if that's just my own situation or it, how do you view that specific event at this current 10 years later? Well, we are, we're on production crew. So the, we work with the Sherwood forest crew. And it's a pretty regular crew of people. So it's kind of the same, same people that we've done other festivals with. And they have a, I think they have a 20 year contract with the head of the crew, Dollar Bill. So we see a lot of familiar faces when we go. It's kind of like, we don't really leave the forest very much. Obviously we're painting the whole time. We sometimes get to see like a set or two of music, but it's mostly just bathroom breaks and, um, and so really we're hanging out with our Sherwood Forest crew, our artist friends the whole time. So I think because we have that kind of buffer and we do get some perks, you know, we have production camping and we get drinks and, and stuff like that. So it may, they make it very doable. If we didn't have our core crew and it was just us four painters, like going into this crazy festival every year, I think it would feel a lot different because, you know, we're, are getting older and some of them stay the same age. <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like the attendees. Um, and I, I went to the first two Rothberries when it was still Rothbury and then didn't go back to electric force until 2015, I think. And it was way different. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like it depends where you at, where you're at and, and who you see. Um, there's definitely still the older crew around there. Um, but now it's pretty much the people I hang out with are our production crew or people who run vending booths that we know just from, you know, 10 plus years on the scene. Yeah. So, yeah, but you know, even though those kids, I think about it as I, I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in Chicago. Um, and I feel like that's those kids only real big thing of the year. And so they go all out like that is, they just fully let loose. So you get a little bit of everything, but I do find that there's a lot of sweetness and a lot of love and a lot of people looking out for each other. 
And that's kind of the main thing. We do get some scary, intense vibes sometimes, especially with people going like too heavy in the drugs. Um, but everyone's pretty great about looking out for each other and, and on it. So, um, you know, I think for as big as it is, they do a pretty good job. And, and the crowd, um, depending on what bands bring in, what people, um, is for the most part, good, nice kids. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I almost feel like it's kind of like the hollow deck from Star Trek where it's like, it's kind of whatever you want it to be. I mean, it's yeah. an unlimited, there's no single de defining point. It's just mm -hmm. honestly more who you are and the vibes that you attract. It's really a, a wonderful playground in experimenting with this idea that like, yeah, you are what you attract. So, you yeah. know, I've never actually had like a bad experience per se. You know, I've just noticed by just observing it, not judgmentally, but just like, the age is a big thing too. And maybe it's just cause I'm getting older. I'm like, Oh, I'm like partying with people who are like 10 years younger than me. Like that feels that that's a feeling. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I know. I started getting that feeling recently. Like, Oh, Oh, like I'm getting old now. Like people are going to start thinking the kids in their twenties. I'm old. Yeah. So not really, but like, it, I'm just trying to get used to it. Yeah. But there's like definitely advantages of, kind of becoming an elder in the scene, which an elder is like anything past 30 for this yeah. specific scene. But like, we really have an opportunity to kind of share the light, share the, the, the focus and the dedication towards bettering yourselves. And that's why I, I think going forward, I'm still going to be in these scenes, even though there's a part of me that kind of feels maybe a little left out. But I also think it's important having traveled so much of the path in these spaces that I have to kind of keep showing up, you know, I feel like I owe it to these spaces for as much as they've given me, you know, and, and yeah. And, and really we're out there too, for those people who it is their first time and they need that, that little bit of light or that anything, just adding more to their experience and hopefully getting them off on the right foot. You know, we try to, we try to have something for people who it's their first time every time. And, and, make it a nice warm loving good experience yeah i feel like we have to keep showing up too just because they've the festivals support us and yeah it's it's a weird thing to have like one foot in and one foot out especially over the past couple of years and we're trying to create a hub here but i think we'll still do a few choice events each year probably not as many as we were um because we've got just a lot of work around here but um, definitely the big ones and the ones that are, you know, Papadocio family always has an extra pull for us. And, um, yeah, we'll do if rainbow serpent ever comes back certain ones, we really would love to go back to, we will, mm -hmm. but hopefully in a few years, we'll have a little place to throw some smaller parties as well. That'd be so cool. Yeah. So we are at time. I do want to ask one more question and I sure. think it's like a good closing one. Um, if you could, how do I want to ask this for the people who consume your art, what is like the highest possible message that you would hope that they would take away from it? Ooh, that was like the biggest question. I'm sorry. That was, yeah, that wasn't tough. fair. <laughs> no. Um, I don't know. I, I think it would probably try to think like what encompasses all of my art because it kind of goes all over the place. Um, but like ultimately the subject matter is, is the interconnectedness of everything. And so I guess if it were to be anything, it would be that, you know, we're all a part of the same being essentially we're we're like one, but we're, there's no, Separation is an illusion, and if we can gear our lives to act in a way that's a little bit more compassionate, empathetic, and um, treat the earth like it's also a part of us as it is, and, you know, there's all these things that are happening in the world that I feel like are because of separation and, and the idea that we're disjointed and we're not, and it's causing our destruction really, you know, whether it's 
global warming, warming using all of these things from the earth that we're pulling out still. And I mean, these trees are our lungs. Like if the earth will, will stay here, we'll die. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I overall message would be that we're all interconnected. We're all part of the same being and hopefully and with a hopeful future, we can step forward with love and just reverence for this life that we have and the people in it and our earth that we live on because, you know, it's, there's a lot of things going in a direction that I wish they weren't, but I think we can, we can do something about it. Hopefully. I love that. And I got to say that that's very similar to how I feel looking at your art. So it sounds like you're Thank doing a good job. <laughs> awesome. That's what I hope. All right, Morgan, that was our time. Thank you so much. This has been so good. It was really nice. Thank you, Brett. And thanks for having such great questions. And it was really a pleasure talking to you. Great. So real quick, where can people find you and potentially like buy prints or canvas or how can people stay in touch and keep up to yeah. date? Um, MorganMandala.com is my website. You can email me on there. Um, you can buy prints in the shop button. I have galleries as well. And then I'm on Instagram at Morgan Mandala. Um, I pretty much update most events on my stories and uh, Instagram posts. I do have Facebook as well, Morgan Mandala, same links. And yeah, you can find me all those places. I have an email, a click away on every one of those spots. So I don't do direct messaging or Facebook messaging or anything like that. I just, just email out of the school, but I will respond to those. And I can confirm you definitely respond to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any events coming up that people can maybe see you do this live painting or are you kind of COVID um, it out? We are doing a show at Threda Gallery in Denver on the 28th, I believe, of September. And then we'll probably be painting at Threda the first Friday after that. So October first Friday. Um, we'll probably do a little bit of live painting. And then yeah just gonna kind of see how everything goes with if lockdowns are happening we're gonna try to go to envision festival in costa rica if we can um we started a mural there before covid and we'd love to finish it up mm -hmm. so that would be amazing and that's what we're gonna that'd be the next big one if we do one that has to be that'd be a really weird thing like you have this before and after this huge dramatic social thing like that had has to be an energy yeah yeah, it would be fun. Go back yeah. and do it. It would it'd be a different painting now. Yeah, it's powerful. Awesome. Well, Morgan, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Of course. Thank you, Brett. Of course. All right, my friends, that was the episode. Thank you so, so, so much for listening all the way through till the end. I really appreciate you. And as always, I make this show for you, the people who are interested, the, the late night crew, if you will. Um, yeah, that was uh, Morgan Mandala. If you want to check out her art, again, it's morganmandala.com. She's on all the socials. You can stay up to date with all her upcoming work. She has some really cool pieces coming out this year. It's so cool to see somebody who's at like the peak of their their creation, their mastery. And uh, she's definitely riding that wave very strongly, if I say so myself. So yeah, that was gonna that's the episode. Uh, like I said, if you want to support the show, head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review, subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook, Instagram. Those are the main ways that you can interact with the show. We also got that fresh Patreon if you want to throw the show some ducats for the price of a cup of coffee every month. Um, you know, it definitely helps. So I really appreciate it. That's patreon.com slash 21st century vitalism next week. Sorry, two weeks out. I'll, I'll get that right someday. Uh, but two weeks out, we have Fergal Smith joining the show. If you are unfamiliar, Fergal is a regenerative agriculturalist from Ireland. He used to be a professional surfer. He ended up hurting himself and started a farm. So we're actually going to be getting into the nitty gritty of how we can best address climate change through our agricultural practices. That is a really good conversation as well. I'm super happy with how that turned out and so honored that he was able to give me a little bit over an hour of his time during one of the busiest seasons of farming. So if you're interested in that and you are concerned about climate change, you want some like practical boots on the ground answers to what we can do, that is an episode for you. So that's going to be out in two weeks. 
and uh, following that, I have another really, really good episode. I'm really excited about, I mean, starting with this going on, it, everything is just picking up momentum. If you haven't felt it, then uh, check out the other episodes. I mean, the ones before this, we got some good stuff coming through. So that's it, y'all. I hope you all have a great couple weeks. Be safe. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. Truly, this is a turbulent time for a lot of people, so I totally understand if things are a little rough. I care about you. I hope you're doing well. Have a good one.